Here's what's coming up on the world today. China is accused of carrying out a major cyber attack earlier this year, targeted at Microsoft servers and affecting at least 30,000 organizations worldwide. The UK lifts COVID restrictions, uh, much to the relish of Britons who have dubbed today Freedom Day. Plus, former South African President Jacob Zuma appears in court via video link. A warm welcome to the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. We begin with cyber crimes as accusations come towards China over a major attack earlier this year that targeted Microsoft Exchange servers and affected thousands of organizations globally. According to the UK, Chinese state-backed actors were responsible, DITO for the European Union, which says the attack came from the territory of China. China has denied being part of what it calls reckless behavior. It's previously denied allegations of, ha of, of hacking and says it opposes all forms of cybercrime. The unified call-out of Beijing signals the gravity with which this case has been taken. Western intelligence officials say aspects of this case are markedly more serious than anything they've seen before. The hackers exploited a vulnerability in Microsoft Exchange, which allowed backdoors to be placed on systems that allowed further access. The UK said that the attack was likely to enable large-scale espionage, including the acquisition of personal information and intellectual property. In the meantime, media reports say rights activists, journalists, and even lawyers around the world have been targeted with phone malware sold to authoritarian governments by an Israeli surveillance firm. They're on a list of some 50,000 phone numbers of people believed to be of interest to clients of the company, NSO Group leaked to major news outlets. It was not clear where the list came from or how many phones had actually been hacked. NSO denies any wrongdoing in this. It says the software is intended for use against criminals and terrorists and is made available only to the military, to law enforcement and intelligence agencies from countries with good human rights records. England today lifted most of its COVID-19 restrictions, but as people relish their freedom, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has cautioned on social contact, recommending that people under the age of 18 be vaccinated. So from today, there will be no limits on how many people can meet or attend events, and face coverings will be recommended in some spaces, but not required by law, among other measures. Here's more in the Global Update. <laughs> The countdown to freedom as Britons have called the lifting of COVID restrictions began at midnight with clubbers in Leeds flocking to one of the first rule-free live music events since the pandemic began last year, dancing through the night and rejoicing in human interaction. Britain, which has one of the world's highest death tolls from COVID, is facing a new wave of cases. British tourists visiting Spain have welcomed the government's decision to lift quarantine on return for fully vaccinated travellers visiting other listed countries. I think it's what people need. It can get people's mental health down. And I think it's good to get back to a bit of normality for everyone. High officials are reaching out to remote communities on the outskirts of the capital to take care of COVID patients as the country struggles to tackle its worst outbreak to date. Public health officials don personal protective suits first before navigating through small canals to provide daily tests on COVID patients isolating in remote villages. South Korea's military has recorded the biggest cluster of COVID-19 infections to date, with more than 80% of Shanghai unit members aboard a destroyer on anti-piracy patrol in the Gulf of Aden testing positive. The country's Joint Chiefs of Staff said that just 50 of the ship's complement of 301 personnel have tested negative in an outbreak first reported on the 15th of July. Authorities have begun an operation to early them home, while a replacement team will steer the vessel back home. Yeah. 
Finally, thousands of pilgrims have attended Arafat's sermon as part of this year's Hajj as the kingdom bars worshippers from abroad for a second year running and restricted entry from within under special conditions to guard against the coronavirus and its new variants. Today, only 60,000 Saudi citizens and residents aged 18 to 65 who have been fully vaccinated or recovered from the virus and do not suffer from any chronic diseases were selected for the right, a once-in-a-lifetime duty for every able-bodied Muslim who can afford it. Chairman, Ministerial Expert, Advisory Committee on COVID-19, Professor Oyewali Tomori joins us now. He's in Ibadan. Professor, thank you for joining us on the program today. It's my pleasure, Marachi. So Britain is our lead today, but I'd like to begin from here in Nigeria with the advisory coming from the NCDC, cautioning six states on the Delta variant of COVID-19. Are you seeing that list? You've seen the caution. We've seen it too. Do you think that it is enough to send caution to just six states, considering how easily transmissible the Delta variant is? I think it's, 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 it's a mistake. Uh, it should have been extended to the entire country. The alert should be for every state. I mean, you know, the virus is, doesn't believe in state boundaries. And from what we see, what we've seen in the past few days, uh, various ceremony here and there, um, no state is free. So I think they should have taken the entire country as on the red alert. And the figures are showing it, although most of it is in southern part, but I think it's a matter of time. All those who went to all those burial ceremony are going back to other parts of the country. But who knows? They may be spreading the disease over there. Yeah, and there is concern of another wave of coronavirus hitting Nigeria, especially with the Delta variant now present in the country. So apparently, the government is not imposing any more COVID-19 restrictions. But do you think that the structure on the ground has been effective? No, I don't think so. I mean, we still have, like I keep saying, what we are having in Nigeria is not because of what we are doing. It is because of what the virus is not yet doing. And I think we need to bring that at the back of our mind. I think there need to be a stricter uh, compliance with all the non-pharmaceutical intervention in government offices. And we as individuals must take a role in that. I mean, you go out everywhere. People are not wearing their mask anymore. Uh, I've been to hotels in Abuja, and even this, the, the um, management doesn't care anymore. And I actually have, in one or two occasions, I told them, if the reception is not wearing the mask, I'm not going to enter that hotel. Each of us have to stand up for that, because I, I think we may be getting ourselves ready for a big wave. You remember the first wave we have, which was in February to about, maybe about eight months the first time. Uh, I, I was looking at the figures recently. We had about 62,000 cases. For that eight month period. The eight months that followed up to this June, June of this year, the number virtually doubled you know, to about you know, more around 40,000 cases. So, if this third wave comes with the Delta virus, which we think is even more severe, I, I think we're in for a major trouble. So, our country would better get prepared. India is an example, and we, we should be, get ourselves prepared. All those who are saying there's no problem, I, I think we're, we're playing with a, with a very, very dangerous situation now. Yeah, and uh, now to Britain, uh, the opposite apparently is happening over there in the UK. Restrictions are being lifted, and yet they have one of the highest uh, death tolls in COVID-19 cases. And I know that last week we did report um, a small town where, you know, the numbers of uh, infections of uh, the, from the Delta variant are multiplying. So do you think that this is a mistake, them lifting most of the restrictions? or a smart move. Uh, a lot of people were in a club, as we saw that in, in the report, uh, just celebrating what they call Freedom Day. I, I think what is happening, I think the Prime Minister is taking a gamble. Uh, he's taken a gamble before. You remember, they lifted it at one time and said they're going to have great Christmas. But within a few weeks, they had to go back to lockdown. I think he's taking another gamble. With, with the rising number of cases that we've seen in Britain, with the almost a large percentage of it being caused by the Delta. I think it's a very, very serious gamble it's taking. So we'll watch and see what happens. But in a case, they are a little better off than we are. A large number of their people are vaccinated. And therefore, they can, maybe they are standing on that, on that effect. But then remember, vaccination does not mean immunization. We don't have a vaccine that is 100% efficacious. 
So there are a lot of people who have that number that will probably will not even develop immunity. Therefore, I think it's a major, major gamble. But we watch and see what is happening. Yeah, and I just want to clear this up with you um, about, you know, people being vaccinated and still coming down with the coronavirus and your thoughts on the booster shot that is being peddled, especially in Western countries? Well, first of all, I think it must be understood that it's expected. I mean, the fact that I got vaccinated, bear in mind that your immunity will not develop the day you get vaccinated. You, you will not be fully developed until about 10 days to about two weeks or more after that. If you get infected during that period, of course, you come down with the disease. So it's a normal thing. I don't think people should get unnecessarily worried about that. But when, when you get your infection, in relation to the time you got your vaccination, would depend. And I, I didn't mention also the fact that we have a vaccine that is not 100% efficacious. So those that you vaccinate, some will not even develop immunity. And therefore, they can get infected and have that, that, that kind of situation. So it's expected. And I think as to the issue of the, sec of the booster shot, I think it is something we need to watch and see because nobody really knows how long the uh, immunization or being the immunity lasts. Uh, whether you give, you don't lose anything by getting extra shots. You know, we did that with polio and other things. The more you get, the more the merrier. But I don't think now that many people don't have the vaccine at all, to be giving a third shot to another group of people when some people have not gotten any, um, I think that's rather, rather unfair. Professor Tomori, thank you so much. Appreciate you joining us on The World Today. It's my pleasure, Marashi. Thank you very much. And stay safe. Oh, yeah. We are in Ethiopia, which has completed filling the reservoir of its huge dam on the Blue Nile for a second year, a move that has already angered Egypt. Addis Ababa says the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, a $4 billion hydropower project, is crucial to its economic development and to provide power. But it has caused concern over water shortages and safety in Egypt and in Sudan, which also depend on the Nile's waters. Earlier today, the state-run broadcaster reported that the second round of filling the dam's reservoir would be completed in a few minutes. Egypt said last month it had received official notice from Ethiopia that it had begun filling the reservoir for a second time and said it rejected the move. Egypt views it as a grave threat to its Nile water supplies, on which it is almost entirely dependent. Sudan has also expressed concern about the dam's safety and the impact on its own dams and water stations. Former South African President Jacob Zuma, who's jailing earlier this month, triggered some of the worst unrest of the post-apartheid era. Today appeared via video link in court to seek a further delay in his arms corruption trial. Uh, Mr. Zuma has pleaded not guilty to charges including corruption, fraud and money laundering. He has cast himself as the victim of a politically motivated witch hunt and his attempts to evade prosecution over more than a decade. Wearing a dark suit and red tie, Zuma said nothing, while his lawyer, Dali Mpofu, argued that the trial in the High Court should be postponed for Zuma to appear in person as opposed to virtually. Mpofu says Zuma had not been able to properly consult his legal team after handing himself over in the early hours of July 8th to start a 15-month prison sentence for contempt of court. Now, efforts to prosecute the ex-president for allegedly receiving kickbacks over a $2 billion weapons deal in the late 1990s are seen as a test of South Africa's ability to hold powerful politicians to account. Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan says the Taliban should end the occupation of their brother's soil, also playing down a warning from the militant group of consequences if Turkish troops remain in Afghanistan to run Kabul airport. The Taliban ruled Afghanistan with an iron fist back in 1996 through to 2001 and have fought for 20 years to topple the Western-backed government in Kabul and reimpose Islamic rule. They're making a fresh push now to gain territory as foreign forces pull out. Speaking to reporters earlier, President Erdogan said the Taliban need to end the occupation of their brother's soil and show the world that peace is prevailing in Afghanistan right away. He says the Taliban's approach is not the way that Muslims should deal with each other. Ankara has also offered to run and guard Kabul's airport in the capital. After NATO withdrawals has been in talks with United States on financial, political and logistical support for the deployment. 
You're still watching The World Today. Still ahead. Well, if they can do it, you can do it. Anyone can keep fit and uh, make moves like that. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the program. Over the last few weeks, we've seen weather around the world change drastically, causing disaster and chaos and displacing thousands of people. While scientists are not too quick to jump on climate change as the cause, how else can we explain these? Weather events in the year 2021 have perhaps made it clearer to G20 governments around the world the importance of climate change as they hold meetings in Italy from July 22nd to 23rd. The G20 members account for more than 80% of world domestic product, 75% of global trade and 60% of the population of the planet. The meeting comes nearly two weeks after the European Union unveiled its most ambitious plan yet to fight climate change, with a dozen policies setting out in unprecedented detail how to overhaul its 27 economies to become greener this decade. Latest events have shown decision on mitigating climate change needs to come sooner as nature lashes out. Case in point, recent floods in southern Germany as rivers overflow their banks, killing over 180 people. Parts of Belgium, France, the Netherlands and Switzerland were also affected. There have been tornadoes in Canada, wildfires in the United States, a heat wave in the northern hemisphere, floods in parts of Asia and most recently in Lagos, Nigeria. The Nigerian Meteorological Agency predicts normal to above normal rainfall season this year across the country. Beyond Nigeria, a new NASA study says coastal flooding is a far more urgent problem than previously thought. Its study suggests cities along coasts should expect a surge of flooding as soon as the next decade. So in the coming decades, as sea level continues to increase from global warming and it's increasing across the globe, the combination of sea level rise associated with global warming and then natural drivers of sea level variability, so the things causing sea level to go up and down just naturally in, in, in the ocean, are going to combine to cause coastal flooding. And what we found is that this increase in coastal flooding is really going to be um, increased significantly in the coming decades, specifically in 2030 to 2040. Some scientists say even under the best scenarios for emission reductions, the world will still have to get used to more extreme weather events and that while extreme weather events have been directly attributed to human-induced climate change like the June heat wave that hit North America, the data still needs to be crunched to make a direct link between the weather seen in places like Germany and human activity. Climate change experts Dr. John Osoma joins us now from our Abuja studio. Dr. Osoma, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Is climate change the reason behind these weather disasters? Uh, to a great extent, yes. Uh, and here are the reasons. There are three main climatic factors that we need to look at when it comes to flooding all over the world. The first one is the heat wave that we're seeing. Uh, climate change, as you know, leads to extreme weather events. And one of those events is the uh, rising temperatures we're seeing, record temperatures all over the world. So what happens is when you have high temperature, you tend to have more evaporation, which sucks up moisture into the atmosphere. And when you have excess moisture, you're going to have rain, a lot of rain, a lot of uh, precipitation will come down. So that's one factor. The other factor is that the heat uh, being caused by climate change has led to a drastic melting of the Arctic ice. Uh, and the Arctic region is very strategic. The water flows into all our major oceans, uh, the Barents Sea, Pacific Ocean, Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, all are fed by the Arctic Ocean, Arctic ice melting. So that has raised our baseline level along the coastlines. Uh, so you, when you have a raised baseline, you don't need a huge weather event to have flooding. 
So what is happening now is, whereas you would have small rain that would just dissipate naturally, now it's leading to catastrophic flooding. Uh, that is what is happening in Europe. That is what, what is happening in Lagos here. Uh, and then the final way that climate change is contributing to what we are seeing is uh, climate change makes the ground very arid, very dried. Uh, and when you have that, it, it loses its natural ability to absorb water. That is why you have flash flooding in the northern part of Nigeria, uh, because the ground does not have the ability to absorb the water naturally. Now, I've heard about uh, uh, the term moon wobble. Uh, some scientists have been mentioning that in recent times, uh, though they say that this will most likely be visible in the 2030s. What is a moon wobble, and then how much worse could things get even before 2030? Uh, a, a moon wobble, uh, in order to understand, you have to understand the interplay between the planetary and heavenly bodies. There is always this delicate dance. The moon revolves around the earth uh, every month, uh, every, about 27 days. Then the earth is also revolving around the sun every 365 days, uh, rotating every 24 hours. That's why we have night and day. So that interplay is happening all at once. And, and there is misalignment sometimes because some of the orbits are elliptical. They are not round. It's like a stretched circle. So depending on where you find one object at a particular time, it may be closer or it may be farther away. When the moon is closer, the gravitational pull on the Earth is stronger. That is what leads to tides. Ordinarily, we have two tides because of the gravitational pull of the moon every day, every 24 hours. But over time, because of that tilt, because of that misalignment, about every 18 years, you have a huge misalignment, which now increases the gravitational pull of the moon. We are now caught in that cycle, in that wobble. Uh, the next one will happen at about 2030. And when that happens, it raises the tide level, it makes the tides monstrous. Uh, and it leads to more flooding, as we're seeing now, uh, leads to more coastal erosion. So that, that's what we mean by a moon wobble. It's a natural phenomenon. It happens every 18 years or so, but it, it is very, very important in understanding why we are having flooding more frequently now. Um, very quickly, if you can, in 30 seconds, how do we mitigate climate change? We need to understand that what is happening is being caused by climate change. We are seeing more frequent flooding in many, many places. So we need to reduce our carbon emission. We need to build dams and levees. We need to build differently on the coastlines. We need to raise up the structures. We need to also check what is happening with our dams. We are not desilting the dams the way we should. We need to build new dams to return the water. And we need to move people inland. People along River Niger and River Benue and along some of the coastal regions in Lagos, this is going to keep happening almost every year now because the baseline level of the sea is higher. So it doesn't take much for the sea to overflow and flood these areas. That's right. what we're seeing now. Dr. John Osoma, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for you know, explaining all of these to us and uh, helping us to prepare for the future. Thanks again. Thank you. It's a pleasure. As we end the world today, a street dancing group comprising seniors with the average age of 56 in central China city has used their energetic hip-hop moves full of enthusiasm for exercises to overwhelm everyone around the world, including us. The street dancers who call themselves the Fire Rose Female Street Dancers come from different walks of life in Zhengzhou City of central China's Henan province. They're making final preparations for next week's TV reality program aired by Channel Central Television, shifting from training three times a week to training uh, twice a day. Among the 15 members, the youngest is around 40 years old and the oldest is already 70.
Yeah, they may be older, but I can tell you old age is far from these ones. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Rebani. <laughs>